Aloha. We welcome you all to this special Think Tech lecture program. And we welcome Shirley Daniel, Director of the Pacific Asian Management Institute, PAMI, organizer and convener of the program. And every year, PAMI presents the Paul Chung Memorial Webinar Lecture. Uh, the speaker this year is Tom Cooney of General Motors. His talk is entitled Transformations in Transportation, Exciting Innovations in the Auto Industry. Now, Shirley, would you be so kind as to tell us about PAMI, what it is and what it does? Thank you and aloha, Jay, and everyone. The Pacific Asian Management Institute, PAMI, was founded over 40 years ago in 1977 by Dr. Chung, who was an economics professor at the UH Manoa Scheidler College of Business. Dr. Chung foresaw many of the changes in global economic conditions and business and realized how important the Asia Pacific region was going to be to the US and to Hawaii. Sadly, Dr. Chung was only in his 50s when he passed away over 30 years ago on August 28, 1985. Dr. Chung was born in Korea and came to the US for his education, earning his PhD from the Michigan State University. After becoming a professor at the University of Hawaii, Dr. Chung developed the early PAMI programs around the concept of planned interaction between students, managers, and faculty from throughout the world. He invited a who's who of international business scholars from both sides of the Pacific to participate in the PAMI programs. The Dr. Chung Memorial Lecture is a highlight of our PAMI program and is made possible by the generosity of Mrs. K. Chung, who established the Dr. N. H. Paul Chung Memorial Lecture Fund. Over the past 30 years, in addition to this lecture, Mrs. Chung has also endowed scholarships and programs in the William S. Richardson School of Law, the Center for Korean Studies, and the Scheidler College of Business. We thank Mrs. Chung for her generous support of PAMI and the University of Hawaii. I'd also like to thank Jay Fidel and Think Tech Hawaii for helping us expand the tradition of our lecture through the Think Tech platform. Thank you, Jay, for your support of the university and PAMI. This year, our topic focuses on innovations in the auto industry, a particularly important topic since transportation is one of the most important factors in the national economy and is one of the most important factors in Hawaii. As the world grapples with issues of climate change, Electrification of vehicles and infrastructure needed for them will be a key element for Hawaii going forward. Thank you to all attendees for your continued support for our programs. We greatly appreciate your participation in the webinar today as we celebrate the life and work of Dr. Chung. At this time, I'll turn it back to Jay to introduce our speaker, Mr. Tom Cooney. Thank you, Shirley. Our speaker, Tom Cooney, is Vice President of Global Public Policy at General Motors. He oversees GM's international engagement and its partnerships with the U.S. and foreign governments, all in support of GM's vision of carbon neutrality and an all-electric future with zero emissions, zero crashes, and zero congestion. In addition to these government relations duties, Tom worked on the GM Project 5 team that built and delivered 30,000 life-saving ventilators early in the COVID-19 pandemic. Before joining GM, Tom had a 25-year diplomatic career in the State Department and attained the Senior Foreign Service rank of Minister Counselor. He was Chargé d'Affaires at the Embassy in Argentina and served as Deputy Chief of Mission in Argentina and Hong Kong. He had assignments in Beijing, Shanghai, Santiago, Washington, and was foreign policy advisor for PACOM. As you'll see, as a result, Tom became a very diplomatic person. <clears throat> that said, I give you Tom Cooney, Vice President of Global Public Policy at General Motors, on transformations in transportation, something that will undoubtedly affect us all. I give you Tom Cooney. 
Tom? Hey, thank you, Jay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Shirley, as well. This is, um, I, I really uh, appreciate this opportunity for multiple reasons. Uh, I have strong ties to Hawaii from my time uh, when I was with, with PACOM, um, and that's uh, when I fell in love with the islands. And so the, the opportunity to, to be here today and to talk with all of you is uh, about what I'm very passionate about in the auto industry is fantastic. Um, I also wanna mention it's a great honor to be doing this with the Dr. Paul Chung lecture. Um, you know, given that I work for General Motors, we have very strong ties to Korea. We have multiple factories, a big manufacturing foot, fit, footprint in Korea. I'll be there again um, for a visit uh, in early October to visit with the new government. Um, I work for international government relations and, and run that for General Motors. So I'm traveling throughout the world very, very heavily in the Asia Pacific. So it gives me a lot of opportunities to stop by uh, Honolulu as well. Um, as I go into the slides, um, there's going to be a lot of, you know, GM stuff. There's going to be a lot of GM pictures and things like that. I'm not trying to sell anybody any cars today. Uh, it's just a topic that I know best. And I think that what it, uh, General Motors is doing is really emblematic of what is uh, going on across the whole industry, lots of different automakers. So I'll talk about General Motors. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about other companies as well but I'm really using us as an example of what's happening. And that's really significant because, you know, GM is a company that's 114 years old. When you think of Chevrolet and, and Cadillac and, and GMC and Buick, you're thinking of, you know, these great gas vehicles of the past. All of that is changing. And that is what attracted me to move from a long career in diplomacy uh, to, to General Motors. So let's get going. So I chose uh, this first slide because if you remember the Hummer, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the original Hummer, it was this big, huge beast, uh, not good on gas at all, quite the gas guzzler. Um, and so that is the, as you look at it, that's the left side of the picture, the old traditional Hummer. On the right side is the brand new one, all electric. I mean, it couldn't be more different. It looks, it looks similar, it's still the same kind of rugged vehicle, but it's all electric, zero emissions, it is a sea change, and I this is kind of emblematic of what's happening in the industry. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a great vehicle, can go zero to 60 in, in three seconds and, and very quiet and uses no gas and, and um, uh, carbon emissions free. So where is all this coming from? You know, just to put this in context, why is this uh, happening now? Um, there's a variety of factors. The biggest factor is is the um, you know we're all more concerned with the you know with the climate and with the increasing emissions and what can we do about it? And we've got the Paris Accords, various national uh, commitments. So companies like GM uh, want to do their part. Uh, we're making massive investments in this technology, massive. So it's you know it's not depending on uh, government subsidies. Uh, it, it's, it's our own, you know, skin in the game, if you will, uh, $35 billion of investments, Volkswagen group making very similar investments, Ford, uh, others, Tesla obviously is all electric from the very beginning. Other companies, uh, are, are lagging behind taking a wait and see approach, but, uh, we are, um, you know, we're, we're, we're all in. So the, uh, uh, a lot of national governments are also saying it's time. Uh, you, we need to, to make this switch. So, uh, for example, in California, as of 2035, in California, nobody can sell any new gas um, internal combustion uh, engine vehicles or what we call ICE vehicles, the traditional vehicles. You, can, you can't buy a new one in California. You'll be able, after 2035, you'll be able to continue to drive your, your old one, but you can't buy a new one. And then there's 15 other U.S. states who follow California, and they'll do the same thing. Um, and there's countries around the world. Um, the U.K. has a similar um, rule by 2035. British Columbia, Quebec in Canada, Chile, all by 2035. Some are saying 2040, but this is, this is moving along. Other things that are happening is, is autos are no longer going to be just simply the vehicle that gets you from place to place. They are becoming like rolling iPhones at this point. The, uh, all of our new vehicles will come with what's called an Altify system. So 
your traditional infotainment, it, this is going to change as you know it. And uh, you've probably seen that in Tesla vehicles and, and others. Um, so the amount of data that's rolling across vehicles um, creates a lot of new issues for privacy, but it also creates uh, new um, uh, revenue streams as well. Automakers like General Motors are becoming uh, tech companies. It is, it's not just uh, you know, building the, uh, the four wheels and the steering wheel and, and going from point A to point B. So the, you know, where, where, where do we get there? What has to happen? First of all, to make EVs affordable, the cost of the battery has to come down and it has been coming down. And that's where, you know, when I talk about $35 billion of investment, a lot of that is in battery technology. So bring, changing, uh, experimenting with the battery chemistry with the uh, lithium, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, the, the graphite that goes into the battery, everybody's got their secret formula. Everybody's got their, uh, their mix and nobody's got it perfect yet. And so there's, um, everybody's working on that, trying to make batteries more dense and energy efficient and also bringing the cost of the batteries down. Um, and also working in very environmentally sustainable ways as well. And I can talk more about that as well. We need smart and effective public policy. We're seeing a lot of that. We've had a lot of uh, efforts around the world um, from various governments. Just recently in the United States, um, the Infl Inflation Reduction Act includes massive investments in consumer purchase incentives. You know, consumers have to be have to be convinced um, and, and you have to give them financial incentives to, to, uh, to make this kind of investment. Um, so that is included in uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and also um, manufacturing production incentives. And the US government is, is using this as a way to try to keep manufacturing at home as our traditional gas engine factories uh, transform into, into electric factories. Governments around the world are doing the same thing, offering the same kinds of investment incentives. It's a race to try to attract um, these, these factories. And you can see that in Korea, you can see it in China, you can see it in Europe as well. Um, and then of course, there's the charging networks. Um, it's just like back in the day, you know, 120 years ago when people were, you know, transforming from the horse and carriage uh, into the gas vehicle, well, what were they worried about back then? Where will I get gas? What if I run out of gas out in the countryside? So that is a long transformation process and you have to build up consumer um, confidence and, and that they can go and get the energy that they need, the, the charge that they need uh, and to do it quickly. Um, that is the federal government is making a huge investment, $7.5 billion in um, charging networks across the United States. And uh, companies like General Motors are also making their own investments uh, and, and working with charging networks, creating joint ventures and trying to build this out to, in order to reduce range anxiety. Um, just as a side note, all of GM vehicles going forward will have at least you know, a minimum of 300 miles of range on a single full charge. 300 miles. So if you're in Hawaii, that's, you know, that's, that's easy. You can go all, you might be able to go all week without having to recharge. Um, you know, depends on how much you're, uh, you're, you're commuting around the island, but um, that's, you know, at a minimum and then bring it home at night and, and charge it up again. Um, and then of course, you know, if you pay for a bigger battery, then you'll, you'll have even, even more, um, even some of our vehicles can go up to 450 miles at, at their most, you know, deluxe premium, um, um, you know, value. So General Motors uh, is, uh, we are becoming uh, very ambitious. So we are going to be, uh, have a completely electric, zero emissions, light duty fleet by 2035. That's really not that far away. So 100% of our light duty fleet, which is about 95% of, of what we sell. And by 2040, we, we will be completely carbon neutral. So that means all of our facilities around the world also will be carbon neutral. Um, and we're doing that through big investments in renewable energy um, for, our, for our factories, for example. And we're doing that, you know, everywhere uh, across the world. So these are big, this is a big sea change for General Motors. This is a company that is, you know, I was a, I'm originally from Detroit and this is not the GM that I, you know, that I grew up with. 
Um, so that's, and we're seeing these kinds of commitments from, from many other country, uh, companies around the world. Again, some moving faster than others and uh, you know, GM, Volkswagen, Ford, really trying to, to move uh, fast and hard into this uh, space. This is, I, I've alluded to this already, I won't go into all of this in detail, but you know, just the big numbers, um, $35 billion uh, between now and 2025. So uh, between now and, and the next, well, I should say between 2020 and 2025, $35 billion going into electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle development. Down in the lower left, where it says greater than 50% of product development, Last year was the first year when GM put more design and engineering investment into EVs than into traditional ICE, you know, internal combustion engine vehicles. That's huge, 114 year old company. And now more of the money is going into, um, into this direction. Let me also just say, we're not a company that has hybrids. We don't have any hybrids. We, we used to, but we're all in on electric. Uh, hybrid vehicles are are good in the sense that they uh, certainly are better than in internal combustion engine vehicles, but there's still a combustion engine in that vehicle. And studies show that a lot of hybrid owners are um, still driving the vehicles on gas rather than using the electric portion. I, I've mentioned this um, uh, a, a little bit, but I think it's worth going into in a little bit more detail. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that was passed last year is um, it has $7.5 billion for EV charging infrastructure. So again, consumers have range anxiety. You know, gas stations are everywhere, but chargers seem to be hard, hard to find. So this is, we're going to see a major build out of charging infrastructure, kind of like going back to President Eisenhower in the 1950s, uh, with the big uh, federal interstate highway plan, um, this is this is analogous. This is a build out of charging infrastructure. We also have to make it the charging experience fast. Um, so our our technology now can get to an eighty percent charge in about fifteen minutes. So if you if you stop somewhere and you you know go inside and you uh, you know you're on a highway and you get a coke. Uh, you get a get a coffee inside. In 15 minutes, your your uh, vehicle can be charged up to 80% of capacity. So that's um, you know again those rates continue to to drop to move faster. Um, and and at, at the same time that the cost of the battery is dropping, which the battery is 40% of the cost of the vehicle. So if you can continue to drive down the cost of the battery, it will continue to make. Um, EVs more affordable. And then the Inflation Reduction Act that just passed, these are huge investments. Um, they, uh, some of the criteria in order to re be able to produce vehicles that will be eligible for the $7,500 consumer investment, it, let, me, let me start there. Um, for those who aren't aware, there will be a new $7,500 um, uh, incentive for consumer purchase if the vehicle meets several criteria in terms of where the battery minerals are coming from and where the batteries are assembled. Uh, and then final assembly needs to take place in North America. And uh, so within the USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement, so it's, it's created a high bar. Congress and the president created a purposely high bar because it wants to incentivize uh, EV production and EV purchases, but also wants the production to be in the United States using critical minerals um, from the United States or from uh, allied and, and partner countries. So it, um, we are shifting our supply chains. All um, companies are, are working to shift the supply chains as much as possible in order to qualify for these incentives as soon as possible. Um, I can talk about that uh, later if there's a question, um, but this is something that GM, um, and my team and others uh, got an early jump on and we're working with, with lots of different uh, companies and countries, uh, including with, you know, thinking again of Dr. Paul, Paul Chung, we have um, great partnerships with a series of Korean companies, including LG Energy and POSCO Chemical, uh, working closely on battery production, joint ventures, and also the processing of the critical minerals 
that, uh, that goes into the battery cell packs. So um, GM in Korea, US in Korea, um, very, very important ties. Ford doing the same thing with a different company called SK Innovation uh, for their battery production. So again, you know, another, another US company, it's you know, good examples of, of work together under the Korea-US free trade agreement between, between old allies. Of course, in China, General Motors has a huge footprint, uh, manufacturing footprint in China. Um, by and large, what we build in China is for China. It's not exported. And there, we're also uh, building batteries and building electric vehicles. And we're doing that with a Chinese partner called CATL. So um, back to the topic of, of charging, because this is first and foremost, you know, the, the vehicles are coming, the products are coming. Uh, they're beautiful. They're great. They have, you know, long life. Uh, but again, it's the range anxiety and building out the fast charging network. So I mentioned the, the uh, 7.5 billion that the U.S. government is distributing to, to the states. Um, the Department of Energy is, is doing some of it directly, but uh, much of it is being given to the states to, to build out locally. But we're also making our own direct investments. Um, this is, you know, this is a private and public sector challenge. And so we are working with a variety of companies, including one announcement, a, a company called Pilot Company, where we're putting um, $750 million of GM funding to charging networks uh, across the country. I won't go into this too long. This is not a chemistry class. Um, I feel like I've gone back to sometimes in this job, like I've gone back to high school chemistry. Um, I mentioned, you know, so in the EV battery, the primary input materials are, uh, as you can see on the left, left, lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, silicon, and graphite. Um, automakers around the world and also other industries are uh, in a race to secure as much of this material as possible from around the world. Uh, and also rare earths as well. These are not rare earths, but there are rare earths that are used in, in magnets in other parts of the uh, of the drivetrain for um, uh, for the drive units for the vehicles, so we are um, working with Korean companies, Australian companies, Canadian companies um, to um, secure uh, supplies, and um, we've done so. We we feel very confident in our in our work so far, but of course we're building we're we're dealing with a lot of external shocks as well, like the Russian in invasion of Ukraine. Uh, drove up the cost of nickel dramatically because nickel was a, uh, a key, uh, Russia was a key source of, of nickel. So, um, you know, we're seeing supply, uh, uh, supply chain shocks around the world. Um, a lot of the, the part of it, if we can go back to that slide, um, thank you. Part of the, um, there's, there's the mining of the raw materials, but then there's the processing. As I said, you know, everybody says that, you know, all the all the minerals are in China. That's actually not true. All the processing is in China. And that started, you know, decades ago with the processing of batteries for consumer electronics, you know, for Sony Playstations and 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 cameras and things like that. So the, the raw materials are really mined everywhere. And we have some in the United States as well, Canada, like I said, throughout the Americas. But um Processing them is is the key, and and China is has about eighty percent of that. So it's never wise to um, to depend on on any one link in the chain. Um, so diversification of processing around the world is is important to do. Um, and again, it's not going to be like China will be squeezed out of that uh, market, that industry, for a long time, and probably never, because again, we produce in China for China but it's just creating diverse sources of the minerals and of the process uh, minerals. That's just good business, um, it just period, uh, business one-on-one so that you're not, um, you know, fortunately we're, we were not uh, dependent on Russian nickel. Uh, we saw those risks uh, for, uh, forthcoming and we started to, to make uh, alternate arrangements, um, you know, over the course of the last year. So, um, you know, having diverse supplies is, is just good business all the way around. And this is just an example of what General Motors is doing. Again, other companies making similar moves if they're, if they're as aggressive on, a, on electric as we are. Um, there's some of the companies that we're working closely with. 
LG Chem is our joint venture partner to build batteries. We have four battery plants in the United States built uh, with LG Chem under the name of Ultium Cells. So Ultium Cells, you can see there is a joint venture. And the first one just opened up and just started operating a month ago in Ohio. And several more are scheduled to open. Uh, Posco Chemical, another Korean company, uh, we are opening up a plant in Quebec, in Canada, together with POSCO to do the processing that I just talked about. So it'll take raw materials from around the world and turn it into the cathode active material that ultimately goes into the cell packs uh, at these battery plants like the one in Ohio. So we, that's just an example of the chain that we are um, in the process of building. Company like GM, I can't speak for other companies, but um, we are very unlikely to go down and become miners ourselves, um, to actually go into such vertical integration that we buy a mine in, in a nickel mine in Canada or a, a, you know, a cobalt mine in, in, uh, in Australia. Battery recycling, this is extremely important. We don't wanna build all these batteries and have them go into landfills. Um, so every battery that uh, we currently have, you know, we have a lot of Chevrolet bolts on the road, for example. Um, every one that comes back is, is recycled or reused. Um, there is, you know, a lot of, so recycling, it is, the technology has improved to the point where we can, you can break down an old battery um, and, and then recycle those, those minerals and use them again. These, these minerals are precious, they have value. So we want to use them again, put them back into the uh, CAM, the cathode active material recycling process. Um, so recycling is, is critical. Another um, secondary form is we believe batteries can have a second life. So if a battery goes down to about 70% of its, um, of its of its usage, um, you know, from from when it was in a vehicle, it still can can be a stationary source of of power. It can be located outside of schools. It can be located outside of factories. Take um, um, energy that's brought in from solar panels, for example, and then put it back into the back into the grid or put it back into that particular facility. So. Um, uh, you know, we strongly believe and we're working with regulators on how to ensure that batteries don't go into landfills. They're too valuable and they have alternate uses. These I'm going to go through uh, really rapidly. Um, again, not selling any vehicles here. I just want to demonstrate there is a wave of EVs coming from companies like General Motors. Um, right now on the road, we have that Hummer I talked about. There, um, we have the Chevrolet Bolt, which has been out there since 2017. That's older battery technology. Everything coming out now will have a uh, Ultium uh, battery in it, which is um, uh, much longer life, higher battery density, faster charging. Um, so these are vehicles that um, you'll start seeing next year. They were just featured at the uh, Detroit Auto Show. Um, the, you know, the only point I'll make about these <clears throat> vehicles and in the next slide is that GM has long had a history, a philosophy of building a car uh, for every purse and purpose. That was a quote from the legendary CEO named Alfred Sloan. And, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the MIT Sloan School of Business is named for him. Uh, we want to build uh, for, for every price point. And this is really important to our diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives as well. We're not just going to build luxury vehicles. So if we go to this net, that next slide here that you were just showing, um, yeah, these, these are more expensive vehicles. Um, these would not qualify for those new consumer purchase incentives because Congress set a certain price point. So a lot of the Teslas out there would not qualify. A lot of the BMWs won't qualify. These two won't qualify either. The Hummer is, uh, a very expensive super truck. There's going, you know, I mean, it can it can drive diagonal actually. And then the Cadillac Lyric is a beautiful, beautiful vehicle. The price point there is sixty thousand dollars. But on the previous slide, I showed you that we're coming out with vehicles. The the electric Equinox will be at the thirty thousand range. The Bolt is already below thirty thousand. So we're trying to come out um, at a variety of price points and really have good value. 
Okay, and then here's a um, here's the number one selling electric vehicle in all of China. Uh, this, believe it or not, it, it is a GM joint venture with uh, SAIC, which is Shanghai Automotive, um, GM, and Uling, which is in uh, Guangxi uh, province. And um, Tesla sells the most EVs in China, the overall volume, but the number one selling model is the Hongguan Mini. Uh, people love it. It can. It's very, very small. It's kind of like the size of a of a smart car, and costs around five thousand dollars. It can only go a hundred miles on a single charge. But what people are buying it for is to be an urban getabout. So if you're running around Chengdu or China, um, Shanghai or or Guangzhou, um, you charge it once a day. Charge as fast, and um, and again, it's very customizable in terms of colors and things like that. This this is just a little bit more about how we try uh, to help customers with their charging networks. So, make uh, giving them big discounts for uh, installing a fast charger at home. Um, you can charge it off of your typical 120 volt plug that you might already have in your garage if you have a garage. Um, that's fine, but it'll be slower or you can get a fast charger and um, GM and other companies are, are offering discounts uh, to be able to install those um, at a, which are 220 volt, much faster charging and, um, and to cut the cost. This is just really quick. Um, when we talk about EVs, we're not just talking about um, uh, passenger vehicles, but also delivery vehicles. So these FedEx and Amazon trucks, um, they are all going to be going uh, electric. We launched a brand new brand called Bright Drop that you'll start seeing on the roads. Uh, FedEx, Walmart, and um, Verizon are all um, early customers. So these are all electric and they come with um, electric vertical pallets like storage lockers inside that are also um, electric propelled and will make delivery much easier and uh, uh, package tracking much easier. Autonomous vehicles, really quickly about this. Um, they're not uh, they're not futuristic. They're actually here. We have autonomous vehicles, uh, fully autonomous, that are operating um, and and actually charging for fares in San Francisco now. Um, and so if you go to uh, to San Francisco, Cruise is is what our autonomous vehicle subsidiary is called. Um, you can actually get an autonomous vehicle ride. And you can check YouTube, and it's it's really happening. Um, they're in limited hours. You know, they're rolling it out slowly, so it's more like in the evening hours. They're only cleared to go up to 35 miles per hour, um, but they're fantastic. They've actually been operating there for eight or nine years um, in testing, and uh, they, we received approval just this year. The first company to be approved to, to operate. Um, and then the other uh, photo on that slide is a brand new. Uh, fully autonomous vehicle called the Origin on the right side. There's no steering wheel, there's no driver position, there's no brake pedal. Um, there's, it's um, two rows facing each other in what we call campfire seating. Uh, that's not futuristic either. That is actually going to roll out in Dubai, uh, which really wants to be the first country in the world to have this kind of service. Uh, by the end of 2023, we'll begin a robo taxi service using the cruise Origin, that vehicle there. Uh, in Dubai. So thank you, Jay. And now uh, we'll uh, give it give it back to you. Obviously, I'm very excited about all these all these things that we're doing. And we're, we have a lot of challenges and, and we're trying to be ambidextrous in the sense of we're still producing great, uh, you know, gas vehicles, all, all these uh, automakers. But at the same time, we're going through the, the transformation to EVs. You know, uh, thank you very much, Tom. Um, great remarks. And you're right. It's very exciting, and uh, you know it, it may be even more exciting than we think. You talk about self-driving in Dubai. If that's successful, the world will see and note. And gee whiz, it won't be very long before everybody wants one. Every community, every organization, every driver. Um, so it, you know you might be able to excite the world in such a way um, so that things move even faster than we can imagine. So we have some questions for you, Tom. Uh, Shirley and I have both written up some questions and call them moderator questions, if you will. And this is a, an amalgam of all of that. First question is, uh, you know, you, you may have heard this before, um, as GM goes, so goes the nation. They don't say that about any other car company. Um, and so what, what you're portraying is a picture of activity, 
um, admirable and, and inevitably altruistic. But this is a, you know, a capital corporation, um, and we have to be mindful of GM's bottom line. Suffice to say, in the world today, we, we all of us, want GM to succeed in this initiative. But we realize there's risk, there's capital investment, huge capital investment, there's re retooling. And in the car company, retooling means a lot. So yes, it sounds like there's altruism, but there's also got to be a profit motive here too. Um, and I guess my question on that is, uh, are you going to make money doing this? Or is this such a risk that you can't say? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a great question. It, 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 it is altruistic in the sense that it's what the world needs. It's what the climate needs. It's, it's what governments want and, and peoples want. But it also, absolutely, we think that this is a winning business model. We think that these are great vehicles, that the market is ready for this move. And it's as we continue to drive down the cost of the, um, of the battery, like I said, which is 40% of the vehicle, um, and, and with these technological advancements, yeah, we, we think that these will be successful, popular, uh, profitable vehicles. Uh, we, we can't survive. We are publicly owned. We have shareholders. We have, you know, markets. Uh, so we, we absolutely have to have winning products that, that win market share. Um, and without these, without these investments, and if, if we wanted to, you know, just continue to do gas forever, um, that 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 would be risky. I mean, that would be that would be closing the doors eventually because governments are not tolerating that. Governments are actually the fuel economy, corporate average fuel economy restrictions, and the greenhouse gas emissions restrictions in California, in British Columbia, in Korea, in Chile, everywhere are getting stricter and stricter. If companies can't meet those, we have to pay penalties. So that's actually raising the cost of a gas vehicle for the automaker at the same. So that cost is going up. But at the same time, we have the cost of the battery coming down and for at least the next 10 years, consumer purchase incentives. So we think that this is the key period that we're that we're going into where the costs will meet and uh, the consumer purchase incentives will will prove to the customer that these are good value vehicles. Yes, and you, when you talk about risk and you talk about uh, you know global expansion, which you're actively involved in right now, um, you talk about enhanced risk because you have geopolitical issues, and we know in this world today that can erupt anywhere, anytime. We see it happening in the in the newspaper every day, uh, so that adds to the risk. And uh, you know, it, it's like this is the perfect storm for you because you are a diplomat of a long career. And you understand how the United States is uh, seen in other countries and continents and how people deal with technology, manufacturing, global competition. So my question to you is, um, you know, is that on a continuing basis, are you satisfied that is a manageable risk? And is the expansion of GM a foreign policy asset? Is there a benefit here? In other words, when you go into a country and do well and sell to that country, and develop technology and give that country, you know, um, a, a leadership position in this industry. Um, you're getting a benefit not only for yourselves, but for the United States. Am I right? Yeah, I think that any company, uh, whether it's GM or you know any company that is doing strong business with another country, um, the U.S. government appreciates that it's a bridge it's a commercial bridge between countries and you know from my days as a diplomat you know the, the the core mission of a diplomat is to be a bridge builder um so facilitating business and trade between countries was always extremely important so when you look at the u.s korea relationship i talked a little bit about you know the ties that we have and i know that the u.s government considers uh, that to be an asset um, we have a, a strong presence, you know, in many countries around the world, and it's always, you know, it's always considered to be to be a very strong thing, um, and and appreciated uh, by you know AmChams, uh, American Chambers of Commerce around the world as well. Um, in terms of uh, supply chain shocks and risk, you know, that's that's my job. You know, we're supposed to see ahead uh, the best we can. 
Um, you know, there's a, there's a great, great quote somewhere that's, uh, you know, forecasting is really hard, especially when it's about the future. Um, but, you know, sometimes we, um, sometimes we get it right. Like I said, we, we saw increasing tensions uh, uh, arising. We weren't predicting the Ukraine invasion when it happened, but we were becoming less and less comfortable. So we started to um, build, uh, build up buffer stocks of some of the raw materials coming from there. Uh, we didn't have a big business in Russia selling vehicles. Uh, we had actually sold our, our last plant uh, in, in Russia a couple, a couple of years prior. Um, you know, U.S.-China relations, uh, you know, we are, we have a big presence in China. We're um, very important in China. China is very important to General Motors. Uh, North America is our home. It's our, it's our home market. Um, Detroit is our headquarters. Um, and so these kinds of, you know, it, it can create, when, when U.S. and China have such rising geopolitical tensions, it can certainly create friction, friction and, you um, and, and risk that we need to manage. But at the same time, I see companies like General Motors that are long investors in uh, China as you know, providing some glue in the relationship. Um, and I think that's, that's important to, to have. So we, have a, uh, we maintain strong ties uh, there and, and here. Um, and that's you know, part of what my job is, is to make sure that we, um, that we navigate well uh, in that geopolitical environment. Yeah, we should never underestimate the value of uh, industrial diplomacy. And uh, I think that's a really important feature of the relationship. So, um, okay, in losing fossil fuel cars, which California and other states will undoubtedly follow, and the federal government will follow, in losing fossil fuel cars, we're, we're losing a diversity of fuels. You know, I mean, up to this point, you could have electric vehicles and you could have fossil fuel. Both of them on the road. Um, so if one gets weaker, then you go to the other and vice versa. Uh, if we go to electric vehicles as the standard, uh, aren't we becoming dependent on one, that is electricity, um, and losing that diversity, whatever the value of it is? And could that be a problem going forward? For example, uh, if the grid goes down in a part of the country, um, we won't have any electricity to run our EVs, right? Yeah, there's, you know, there's always concern about, you know, loss and gain whenever there's a technological revolution. And that's exactly what we're having right now. Um, and, and so with that comes, with change comes fear. Um, would we, you know, am I going to run out of charge? What if the grid goes down? But at the same time, you know, what are we gaining? We're gaining a world that is going to be cleaner, greener, uh, much, much better for our children, uh, protecting the climate. We're also gaining practical things like uh, when the grid goes down, well, you've got sitting in your driveway a massive battery that can power your house and um, can also plug back into the grid. You know, this is, this is actually um, you know, something that your, that your own car, your gas car, couldn't do. So I think that we're, we're gaining, they're also quieter. I mean, we'll end up having you know, much, much uh, you know, less noise pollution as well. Um, and so there's, there's always going to be a change uh, when there's, um, you know, a, a little bit of fear of, of loss when we go through a big change. But, you know, again, back 120 years ago or so, we, we switched from uh, the horse and buggy. So we lost the horse and buggy. But, you know, what did we gain as a result? Last thing I think I would say is there's also hydrogen fuel cell technology. Let me talk a little bit about that for a second. Hydrogen fuel cell technology is also something that General Motors is developing. Uh, we have a technology called HydroTech. We do not see, what's the difference? Why, why, why hydrogen fuel cell vehicles versus EVs? The difference as we see it, um, not all companies agree on this, but as we see it is hydrogen fuel cells are great for applications when you need a lot of power over long periods of time. You know, it's no accident that, uh, you know, Project Apollo used hydrogen to, to go to the moon. Um, so we, HydroTech, uh, we've created these power cubes and we're working with Navistar, the big, um, you know, long range commercial trucking company to use hydro, uh, HydroTech, hydrogen fuel cell uh, engines for long range trucking, hauling, you know, heavy amounts. We're also working with a railroad company called Wabtec for uh, railroad locomotives 
uh, that would not run on you know diesel and everything else that they run on, but would run on hydrogen. So these long haul, um, you know, heavy uh, heavy things. Also, you know, they can use be used um, as stationary power cubes next to ports, for example. You know, in marine areas, they can be used to charge electric vehicles. So there's a lot of um, different kinds of possibilities, but we don't see it as commercially viable to have hydrogen fuel cell uh, vehicles um, as passenger vehicles. Mm. Um, you were talking before the show about the possibility of using hydrogen on the battlefield. Can you guess that? Well, there's, you know, there's different kinds of applications that are being used. GM has a, a brand new subsidiary called GM Defense. Um, uh, GM used to, you know, has a long history of, of, you know, as a military contractor as well. We've gotten away from that. Um, so now there's a, a new um, a subsidiary called GM Defense. It makes some trucks that are gas trucks for um, for military use, um, but there's also experimentation going on with hydrogen fuel cells um, because again, the the hauling capacity they're quiet, um, they can go long range, and uh, so those kinds of um, uh, those kinds of things are underway as well. Nothing in production, um, but but uh, just like I said, you know, locomotives. Um, uh, long distance trucking and, you know, potentially military applications. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left uh, before we have to close. So I want to go to some of the questions that have come in from attendees, okay? Um, and I'll read them. Uh, there, there are a few of them. I, I'll read them to you. The first one is, it bugs me that our policies to promote e-vehicle ownership subsidize the purchase of expensive cars by wealthy people. Does it bother you or what? should we do about it, if anything? Yeah, I mean, that, that I can see how that would bother you. And the, um, the, but under the terms of the Inflation Reduction Act that just passed, that actually changes. And let me look up really quick. There are income limits. There's two kinds of limits um, that, that apply to this uh, going forward. So, so the, old, the old incentives uh, uh, go away and these new ones are, are coming in. But um, any sedan, electric sedan, over 55,000 will not qualify. Any truck or SUV over 80,000 will not qualify for the incentive. Um, so I mentioned that the GMC Hummer EV, it's, it's over 80,000, at least this initial kind of deluxe one. And so that won't qualify. But there's also, um, limits on AGI, you know, the um, adjusted gross income of, of the buyer. So uh, Congress wrote in, um, if there's a joint uh, family income of over $300,000 annual uh, AGI, then um, that buyer does not qualify. Uh, if the person's single, uh, the limit is 100, 150,000. So any single person making more than 150,000 also would not be able to qualify. So again, the you know I, I guess U.S. Congress and, and, Pre and President Biden shares uh, the view of this questioner. Um, you know, by the way, just uh, in the possibility that somebody may have a question that want to uh, get hold of you, what's what's your website? What's the way to get hold of you, Tom? Oh, uh, my my uh, email address is Thomas. Cooney, uh, C O O N E Y at gm .com. Okay, here's another question from an attendee. Uh, since 2018, I have been following solar battery EVs. Today, we have Sono, um, Mercedes-Benz, Lightyear, Toyota, Hyundai, uh, Joylong, and in the U.S., Airstream, travel trailers, and Tesla solar trailers. What are GM's plans for solar integrated EVs or um, stay plug-in charging only. Um, so GM is investing heavily. Uh, obviously, I talked about in EVs and uh, autonomous vehicles and in charging networks, also in renewable energies. Um, I'm not aware of any plans for solar EVs. Um, you know, so I, I guess I'm not I'm not following that as as closely, um, but. We're investing in renewable energies, for example, those cruise 
vehicles that are running around San Francisco, the autonomous vehicles, those are charged uh, entirely on renewable energies. Um, you know, the, we, Cruz has invested in, in um, um, wind energy and solar energy, and that's where that fleet gets all of its charging network from. I, I hope that helps the answer somewhat. But, you know, we are very concerned with um, the transformation of the entire grid. It's not enough just to have clean vehicles, you know, but where are the vehicles getting their energy from? Where are they being charged from? Um, we're not an electric utility, but we're working with electric utilities and with renewable energy suppliers um, to increase uh, renewable energy investments. And that's part of our carbon, fully carbon neutral pledge by 2040 um, as well. So it's, it's not build an EV zero emissions end of story, but it's also where is, um, where is the energy uh, itself coming from, from the grid. Here's a combination question for you, Tom. You know, everything considered, everything you've been talking about, will we be paying more or less right now um, to buy, drive, operate, maintain electric uh, vehicles uh, and the necessary charging equipment? And, and uh, to go along with that, uh, here's a, a kind of personal question. Uh, and that is, I'm in the market for a new car right now. Uh, should I look for an EV, uh, all things considered? Or should I buy a conventional car and wait until the price, the technology, the infrastructure, the market, and so on, or EVs is a little better, maybe in five years or six years from now? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are related questions. Um, again, we're, we're heavily focused on putting out vehicles, EVs, um, with great value at a lot of different price points. So that Chevrolet Equinox that will, it's the 20. 24 model year, but it's going to start appearing uh, on the roads in the fall of 23. Um, the Chevrolet Bolt, you know, is already less than 30,000, and the Chevrolet Bolt EUV um, are, are less than 30,000. So when then when you add in um, the the consumer purchase incentives that just passed, you know, these become very affordable vehicles. So um, the choice. Uh, so I think the the price is we're almost at that equivalent point with, with uh, ICE vehicles, with the traditional gas engine vehicles, uh, because of the way the battery, um, the cost of the battery is, is coming down. So um, I can never advise anybody on their own personal car choice and whether it's GM or you know, Ford or Honda, Toyota, uh, but I, th I don't think anybody has to wait five or six years to look at buying an EV. I really don't. I think the the um, we're coming out with 30 EVs by 2025. So I showed you some of them, but there are 30 coming by 2025, and that's just us. Um, so there's a lot of variety out there. The technology is fantastic. Um, the the charging ability continues to get faster and faster. Um, I think it's entirely realistic. If you buy one now, I don't think you're an early adopter. You know, we've seen that with a lot of the, you know, the people driving the Teslas and the Chevrolet Bolts and the Nissan Leaf that, that I see a number of those on the roads in, um, uh, on Hawaii, in Hawaii. Um, those were the early adopters. This is a proven technology and it's only getting better. So it's sort of like you want to wait for the iPhone two or three or four before you buy the iPhone or, you know, is it time to buy one? That's, that's going to be a personal choice. Tom, we're at the uh, end of our program, really, uh, and it's time for um, uh, you to give us a, a takeaway, final remarks, uh, an integration of all the, these factors and vectors we've been talking about. I hope you will include in your takeaway your perception of how this initiative by General Motors and other car companies doing electric vehicles will affect the United States economy, uh, particularly given the IRA legislation. And, and how, for that matter, it will affect the global economy. It's no small initiative. It's huge. So anyway, I just hope you cover that a little bit in your takeaway. But what message would you like to leave with our viewers today? Sure. I mean, I can address the, that, you know, that specific point about the U.S. Um, so GM has made massive. Let me let me say this. I've been with GM for three years and I do international 
a lot of what I have done, the projects I've been involved with have been um, actually with withdrawing GM from certain markets around the world and, you know, selling a few, um, uh, a few plants here and there, traditional gas engine plants, in order to make these massive investments in EV and AV technology. Um, so there's been a massive uh, reallocation of capital to these very, very ambitious goals. And I've been a part of that kind of, it's almost, I feel like I'm pruning some of the branches of a, of a withered branches of a tree in order to make uh, the, the, the main trunk even healthier. And that would be uh, our investments in the United States. So even just last December, we made the largest announcement in GM history, which is saying a lot, it's 114 years old, uh, $7.5 billion uh, in a single announcement investment in the state of Michigan. That included uh, one of the Ultium battery cell plants I talked about and uh, conversion of existing factories from ICE to, uh, to EVs. Um, so that sort of focus on the United States and, and also our partners in Canada and Mexico um, is, is ongoing and, and is underway. Um, at the same time, you know, places like Korea and China I've talked about are extremely important um, to, uh, to, to General Motors. So, again, talking a lot about General Motors here because that's who I work for. But in terms of broader takeaway, the whole industry, um, it's here. You've been hearing about EVs, and I, sometimes I feel like it's a long windup. But the vehicles are, are coming. They're, they're going to be on the roads. The cost of gas vehicles is, like I said, going to be start to go higher because government public policies are making it more expensive to build those, um, you know, gas-consuming vehicles. The the uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, restrictions are going, becoming stricter, and the fuel economy restrictions are becoming stricter, and that's intentional because. Um, then as we add those technologies to those gas vehicles, it makes that more expensive at the same time that we're driving down the cost of the EV. So it, it's coming. Um, you may be in your future buying, you know, maybe one more gas vehicle, um, but you know, you're going to be considering uh, EVs and, um, and the charging networks and everything else uh, that are coming along with it. Biggest takeaway statement I could make is, is what I said in the beginning. We're in that transformation that's akin to the horse and buggy era, uh, moving to the gas vehicles. And 10 years from now, what the mix of vehicles that you see on the road is going to be vastly different. Gas vehicles will still be on the road 10 years from now, but the electric vehicles are not going to be the rarities. So let me, let me stop there. And uh, thank you very much, Jay. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Tom, Tom Cooney, for helping us understand and see into what's behind the screen, uh, the future for us, uh, and the extraordinary prospects in store for national and global uh, transportation. It's going to be really interesting, really exciting, really great. Thank you so much to everyone for coming, and thanks to those who submitted questions for the discussion. Thanks to Shirley Daniel, Director of PAMI, for setting this up, and thanks to Caramon Lee and our intrepid ThinkTech staff uh, for supporting the program. Um, we'll see you all next year for the next annual Memorial Paul Chung Lecture. So stay tuned for more. Aloha.